I've called this behind the scenes thoughts and processes that make a Nosy Pro app. Um, but I will also be talking about books because I print books because I can't help it. And though I know some of you didn't bring books, I brought really more than enough for everybody. Um, <laughs> so I haven't, if you'll see me in the same clothes tomorrow because I, the suitcase was just like the little suitcase was <laughs> full of books. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Nosy Pro is, Nosy Pro is a publisher that publishes children's books ebooks and story and actually also some game apps. We were founded in 2010. I founded the company after being fired um, from an adult publishing job and I'll tell you about that after a glass of wine, um, where I was for five months. Um, and we began publishing in 2011. From the beginning we thought of ourselves as a print and digital publisher and we, our, we published our first print book in January 2011 and our first app came out in February 2011. We're very small, there are 30 people in the company, of whom three people, three of us, um, work full-time on apps. I am not one of those people. So in standing before you as a maker, I am kind of lying, because the people who make these apps are Will, Ed, and AJ, and you can read about them um, on our website, but with a lot of help from um, Tom and various other people in the company who, who are supporting them, but not in a full-time capacity. Um, we're a multi-award winning, um, though not in fact the Bologna Regazzi Award, um, though we are, we're always the bridesmaid, so there you go, always lovely, and, um, but we have, other people have seen the, um, the outstanding merits of our apps and have given them awards um, rather than mentions, and as a company we're also award winning, so you are um, in the presence of the um, UK's Independent Publishers Guild, Independent Publisher of the Year, that's across adult, children's, educational, professional, and so on. We are independent, as that prize suggests. Um, so the money we spend on books and apps, um, we could spend on shoes for our children, or chocolate, or, or wine. Um, and so that's quite a that's quite a focusing sort of a thing. Um, we're London-based, uh, as you may guess from the accent. Um, and we published about, and I think this is quite interesting in relation to the last comment I made about independence, we published 250 books, but we've published 18 apps so far. We're making money on our print. I stand before you much touted as an expert, but as Warren Buckleitner said in 2015 um, in, at the Bologna um, master class Bologna conference, um, he said there are no experts, there are only explorers um, in this space and I think that is um, painfully true in lots of ways. I thought I'd share with you some very basic print and screen stats, I'm sure there are people who are much much better placed to do this. I thought it would be quite interesting because I tend to use a mix of UK and US stats so the UK ones may be less familiar to you. 97% of 5 to 15 year olds have access to internet connected devices in the UK, that's National Literacy Trust um, information and for those of you who are um, researchers um, and studiers, I would say that the National Liter Literacy Trust website is a fantastic mine of brilliant information about reading in general, reading trends in general, um, with quite a sort of pan-European sort of focus and has a lot of information also about digital learning and the impact of digital um, devices on, on reading. So that's National Literacy Trust data. Um, 68.7% of um, the 5 to 15 year olds reported reading on a computer, phone or tablet at home compared to 61.8% who talked about reading in print. And we're talking about a very wide definition of reading here. So it could be text, it could be all sorts of things. 52.4% said they would rather you read using electronic devices compared to 32% who said that they would rather read in print. I suspect that's slightly skewed actually, but because um, I think they thought that was what the answer should be. But I think it's quite an interesting um, perception on their part that that was what the answer should be. 46% of children in 2012 said they'd rather read an e-book compared to 25% in 2010. Now that's slightly old data now and it's from the Scholastic US e-book survey. Of the children who'd read an e-book, 26% of boys and 16% of girls said they were reading more books as a result of exposure to e-books. <laughs> However, acceptance of e-reading is not a given. Is e-reading to your toddler story time or simply screen time? <laughs> 
said um, <laughs> Douglas Kenwell uh, in an October 2014 New York Times story that was the headline of the piece. And I think that there's a lot to unpack from that, um, from that headline there, um, which is around parental guilt and um, it not being the most expensive, I thought that was a brilliant, um, mm -hmm. brilliant line there from Gail, the most expensive cap, uh, pacifier known to man or woman. Um, so I think there's something very interesting about that. Um, so we are occupying this digital or this creation of story apps at a time when there's a lot of uncertainty on our parts as makers and in the parts on the minds, I think, of teachers, librarians, parents, researchers. Um, the, there's not a lot of clarity in this space. And all we can do as makers is kind of stick to our principles. And I guess these are the principles that we would say we had. When making digital reading experiences for young children, these are the things we think. On screen, reading is competitive with other media in a way that reading has never really been before. So previously you had different objects that perform different functions in your life as a child. And now there is a chance, a good chance, that a lot of those leisure activities are compressed into one space, <laughs> the screen. Some screen time, we believe, should be reading time. Not everybody thinks this, but I'm thinking about this in the context of children manifestly spending more and more time on screen. And the idea that that is time that is taken from reading feels to me quite frightening. We believe that children have very high expectations of multimedia, of interactivity, and of response from screens. And in the early days, we saw a lot of pre-existing books kind of shoehorned quite uncomfortably onto screens <coughs> and children jabbing around disconsolately hoping that something would happen and finding that a very frustrating experience. We think they have very high expectations. We believe, therefore, that reading must not be the most boring thing a child can do on a screen. So for us, it's not about adding bells and whistles to existing books, not least because having been in existence for only five years, we actually didn't have any existing books. Um, but instead, we felt that we had to create new kinds of reading experiences, and that is what we're trying to do. We wanted to learn how to do this. We don't outsource. So everything that we make, we make in-house. So I've talked about this amazing team, Ed Will and AJ, and those of us who are, who are, engaged, who are otherwise engaged in it on a more part-time basis. Um, as we split our time between digital reading experiences and print reading experiences. Um, but we do it all in-house, kind of really end-to-end. -end. And we'll talk about what those processes are from my perspective. For me, that question of reading on screen is hugely important. Because I can imagine, in my worst moments, and I have been a publisher for 30 years, a collective sound of astonished disbelief would be lovely now. Um, 30 years. <gasps> no, no. So much did that very well. Um, we'll we'll, we'll cut all? this and we'll just make it look fabulous. <laughs> Fun video. Um, we'll make that look really spontaneous. Um, it, I've been a publisher for 30 years and for me, um, both professionally but also um, emotionally now, my identity, my life is very bound up with ideas of encouraging children to read and encouraging access to reading and encouraging critically reading for pleasure, not just reading as a function but reading for pleasure. And I sometimes on my bad days can imagine a point at which mass literacy is a 200 odd year blip. Before 1830, we had no expectation that every child would be able to decode text. We just didn't have that as an expectation. And in 2030, 2040, 2050, will it be strictly necessary for children to be able to decode text? Will they not instead be able to ask some marvellous, all-knowing descendant of Siri <laughs> what the, the answers to their questions? Will they need to be able to read? Will they need to be able to write? Will reading and writing become 
Uh, and that all sounds rather fantastical, but actually, you know, my kids have the privilege, one of my children has learned ancient Greek. Bit niche. Um, <laughs> ancient Greek, they've learned. Um, and, and that was something that was a kind of educational staple. Latin and Greek were educational staples. Shakespeare, 400 years ago, small Latin and less Greek, or whatever the phrase was. But he had access to Latin and Greek. Most children now don't have access to Latin and Greek. And we do not consider that a terrible loss. We do not consider them ill-equipped. We do not consider that a, ter a dreadful thing for them. Might we? Can we imagine a point when we might feel the same way about children's reading, children's writing? Because this is what we're up against. And I'm going to show you a child using one of our game apps. Now, it's a game app that we produce in order to engage a child with a particular book, actually with this book, My Brother is a Superhero, which is a middle grade fiction title. But just watch this and think how, whether or not this is something you're going to get from any digital or indeed print reading experience. pretty powerful thing that that child has. He was making his own noises, he was creating his own story, he was making his own text, minimally, there. There wasn't anything that was given to him as a story. We made 18 apps. The ones I'm going to focus on, though, are the ones at the top, these, um, these uh, fairy tale apps. At the, at the very top. We chose to do fairy tales at the beginning for multiple reasons. One, we didn't have other famous bits of intellectual property that we could expand into apps. We didn't own, for example, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. We wanted to have a kind of freedom to experiment with our own intellectual property. Now, the great thing about fairy tales is that everyone's intellectual property. They've been around for hundreds of years. There's nothing to stop any of you making a fairy tale app right now. The other thing about fairy tales is that they are extraordinarily flexible. Their longevity is an indication of the fact that they are very, very bendy. They bend, but they do not break. You can do a lot to fairy tales. You can play with fairy tales in lots of different ways, and that made us feel that they would be a good space for experimentation. Another more commercial reason is that in, a co in the context of an app store where you don't know what you're getting, when you buy that app, you might see some screenshots of various clues that you're getting. You don't, it's quite a closed box before you open it. At least if it says Little Red Riding Hood on it, you kind of have some notion of what it's quite likely to deliver. And finally, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. Who said that? Who said that? Einstein is supposed to have said that. Einstein. It's supposed Einstein? to have said that. Well, it's pretty apocryphal if you actually dig into it. But it's a great quote. I thought Gary said that. Apparently. Oh, she said, children are. Oh, no. Anyway, we'll, we'll cut this from the video, by the way. This will all just be like really smooth. It's fabulous. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going to talk to you particularly about Little Red Riding Hood because um, it was a project that we published several years ago, but it's one of which I have a lot of um, in the make making of stuff to show you here, because this is really kind of what is the plumbing underneath Little Red Riding Hood. Who here knows the Little Red Riding Hood app? Some of you, but not all of you. Okay, <clears throat> I've got a bit of time, then I might show you some of it, but I'm going to talk you through what bits went into it. There it is there, so we can play with it shortly. The first thing to say is that for me as a publisher, this was a much, can you see, or is this really annoying? Um, this was a much more collaborative process than we are used to. Generally speaking, we deal with authors and illustrators, Kafka in this instance, who we obviously don't publish, but um, we ended up not dealing with a single creator. We instead ended up dealing with something that many hands touch. And that makes it a very different experience for us from creating print books. 
um, where, of course, there may be an author and an illustrator, there's an editor, there's a designer, but just the degree of collaboration and the multiplicity of the inputs is extraordinary. And it's, I've never worked in the film industry or in animation, but I suspect it probably has that shared ownership feel in movies and in animation in the same way that I think apps often have got a shared ownership feel. The process is also um, frighteningly um, non-linear. Uh, it's not that straight road with the woods on either side. Instead, um, on a good day, it looks a bit like that. It's the London tube map. Um, on a bad day, it, on a medium day, it feels like that. And on a really bad day, it feels quite like that. <laughs> We're not in a relay here. We're not handing off one thing, for example, the writing, then that gets illustrated, that then gets designed, that then gets printed, in the way that we have a kind of workflow that we understand in relation to print books. We're finding that we have to go back on ourselves because one move forward may necessitate a change at some previous stage. So it's a very, very iterative, very non-linear process. But I will pretend for you that it is a linear process because enough already with the non-linearity. And I will pretend we start in one place and finish in another place. I will pretend we start with the concept which actually probably is the starting point for a lot of this. Remember, we're not publishing an author. We're not receiving something in. This is generated from the company itself. A group of us sitting around a table. For Little Red Riding Hood, um, the start was, of course, the original fairy tale. And looking into the original fairy tale, we discovered something quite interesting, that one of the very early versions, and I'm sure you know this much better than I do, um, is a Provencal retelling of it that dates back 250, 300 years, um, in which we are not dealing with a wolf, we're dealing with a werewolf, a bzu, um, in Provencal um, dialect, a bzu, who, who meets Red Riding Hood on her way to her grandmother's house and says, will you take the path of the pins or the path of the needles? And that became for us the way we thought about Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. We thought of her as somebody who was going through a wood with, us, with choices, with forks in the path. The path of the pins or the path of the needles. In this case, the path of the flowers or the path of the feathers. We decided that the things that Little Red Riding Hood would pick up on her way through the woods would affect the outcome of the story. So within the stru structure of the story, which was that the wolf was going to be defeated, in our version the grandmother was going to be saved, and we might talk about that shortly, um, and Little Red Riding Hood was going to be the person actually who defeated the wolf. Nevertheless, the things she collects affect how she defeats the wolf. So that became, that, that ver the version I showed you is what happens on screen, that became a planning of the story that looked like that, that looked like a, a, a kind of mind map of the paths through the wood and how that would work. And that became then storyboarding. So this is us working out what happens when. And that became proper storyboarding with images. So actually this is confusing me of Jack and the Beanstalk because I don't have the storyboard images for Little Red Riding Hood, work with me here. Um, that's manifestly a beanstalk and an ogre. But um, <laughs> you can, you get the idea. Um, so um, so this is, but this is the, the tool that we use, which is a digital tool that enables us to shuffle those storyboard cards, if you like, around. So it's still concept stage. The next stage, in the process, for the purposes of this conversation, is writing. And um, Warren talked to us, or just mentioned the fact that when you touch one of the characters, they will say a slightly different thing each time. Is that going to work? She lived with her mother in a cottage at the edge of a forest. So you've delivered the narrative now. The narrative, that piece of narrative, it's nice to meet you. is what I would see as the running water, the flow of narrative. That's the story. It has a beginning, a middle, yeah. and an end. Blue map tab to choose a scene. 
And when I touch, what a kind daughter I have. I get narrative, I get in language, text that's not connected with the narrative. It reinforces the narrative, it gives you a perspective on the narrative, but it's not. Nice and bright. Integral to the narrative. Pinch with two fingers to zoom out. Okay. Um, and that can lead you, that can enable you to do all sorts of things. So in our Cinderella app, for example, we've really differentiated between the two sisters, the two mean sisters, they're not called ugly sisters, they're called mean sisters. <laughs> um, the two mean sisters, and one one of whom is very vain, and, and that draw that is her motivation. It's not in the narrative, it's in what she says in the dialogue, and one of whom is um, really rather jaded and cynical, doesn't really you know, sort of drag really going to a ball, um, and you know, pretends to be rather sort of cynical about the whole thing. Well, the other one's a bit more kind of rumbustious and up and at them, but they're both equally unpleasant and unpleasant to Cinderella. But doing having that dialogue gives you the opportunity to build out those characters in a way that the narrative doesn't quite, because we're dealing with a very, very short bit, as you'll see, of narrative each time. One morning, Little Red Riding Hood's mother asked her to help out. So you're not, you're not able to put on the screen a lot of text at once, and that's something that I hope we'll speak about. Say that again for everybody. I don't think you're able to put a lot of narrative on the screen. And we'll talk about that actually in relation to some of the Bologna prize winners tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't think you can. I think what we do is we have the text, that narrative text that you saw, or you'll see again here. Soon the basket's packed and Little Red Riding Hood, obviously this audio here, was ready to go on her way. As she was leaving, her mother gave her a warning. That's about the maximum. We can sometimes get three lines on. We are not allowing the child to interact, to trigger any more stuff while that's running. Mm -hmm. So we're making decisions about the fact that we want the child to have some sense of the narrative. We're, we're defining the space in which you can play around, and you, but you, I, we want it, we made a decision that we wanted them to have a world of narrative. Yes. So Kate, one of the things with students is that the children told me the words at the bottom is the story, and the characters are telling us about the story. Yeah and that they came up on, with their own about that they were learning certain bits of information, like you're saying, and they were able, these were eight-year-olds mm -hmm. who were very clearly pulling that apart without us even asking the and question. So we, and that's why this, you know, we sort of can't think of a better way of describing it. We've got this kind of dialogue that is non-linear, that's kind of floating on the top of other narrative stuff that has real current, that has got a real direction. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're kind of seeing the, the writing process. Um, yeah. The next um, thing to talk about is illustration. And many of you who are um, perhaps not as, you know, a god about technology um, will may be interested to see that it does start with little squiggles in a sketchbook, I mean, as ever was. And these are the sketches you can see from Little Red Riding Hood. You can see various, the emergence of um, the wolf over here. And you can see here, this is Little Red Riding Hood who encounters a, a hill with flowers on it. And you can see that there. So these are Ed Bryan's beautiful, amazing, brilliant sketchbooks. Um, the key thing that he's focusing on initially, Ed, is coming up with the characters. Um, these are the characters, in fact, that one's dated the wolf, um, 14th of March, 2012. At some point, the, the wolf, um, the wolf this had checked trousers. Um, and things like, you know, we're talking, he's, playing, he's playing around with things like leg length, he's doing all sorts of things. And we're very thorough about this. I said to him, you've done a wolf. You did a wolf, like, completely, totally did a wolf in, um, in uh, Three of the Pigs. Just use the same wolf, use the same wolf. And that would be, like, funny and meta. And he said, no, no, for it is a different wolf, and I am an artist, and it is a, it's a different wolf altogether. I see this as a much suave kind of a wolf, and the other one is more brutish. And so we have a much suave kind of a wolf. There you go. Uh, <laughs> That's why our apps cost so much to make. Anyway, so, <laughs> but in the same way that you wouldn't, you would, you would want an illustration to embody a particular characterization in a book, 
I don't see, I, mean, I do hear what he says, I don't think we should be taking that shortcut in an app either. I know most people would. So that's, um, so those are the characters being sketched. After they're sketched, they are made. Um, and they're made once, and this is really interesting for me. They're made once in a T form, um, cross form like this. Um, and this enables us to have maximum mobility when they are animated. If I compare that with something like um, my favourite book, and I'm so hoping we will get to our favourite books, um, um, we, which is where the wild things are. Um, if we look at Max, Max is different each time. Roy Sandak had to draw Max every time he drew Max. It, Ed does not have to draw Little Red Riding Hood every time he draws Little Red, he creates Little Red Riding Hood, every scene she appears in, she's the same person. So these are all the characters from, um, Little, Red Riding, from Little Red Riding Hood. Um, some of them, actually we've got, we're working on something at the moment where we're reusing some of these characters and it turns out the, the, the mole doesn't have a bottom. He's like, like bottom free. Because um, he doesn't ever have to have it in the in the app, and we have a dragon similarly who's also free of bottom. Um, but uh, and they have to have had their bottoms now created. But that, those are the characters from the Little Red Riding Hood. The next thing that Ed moves on to is uh, illustrating the background. Now, iPad screens, the pro notwithstanding, are absolutely tiny compared to books. They are weeny, weeny, weeny. And one of the ways we get round this, and we'll talk about this again later I hope, one of the ways we get around this is by saying then we will have more than you can see at any one time on the screen. So in grandmother's bedroom, Little Red Riding Hood, that light panel here, rectangle, is the size of the iPad screen. But you could move over here and you could move over there. And we use all of that space eventually, but that creation of that background is, um, is something that goes beyond what is strictly necessary to deliver the narrative, to give it a kind of richness. The backgrounds, um, and this, this is mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the Dust or Magic um, little leaflet that you have in your, um, in your packs, that um, Ed is, is drawing a lot of this, but he's also borrowing textures. So this, um, this is a wall of a Welsh medieval castle that he scanned in to create that the inside of that well. So he's using a lot of different techniques to create this. It's all, all the art is done digitally after he's scanned in this. So that's a real scans. well. So that is a real well, or a kind of inside out tower. And you can see here how whole scenes are then made. And this is a good example of something where we're using bits that are not immediately <coughs> apparent. So this is the well room. But then at some later point, you drop the bucket down the well, and we have to have the well continuing beyond the space that we've original, originally created. This is from Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm -hmm. And this is um, demonstrating that we're creating many of the objects and the backgrounds, as we saw here, in three dimensions. So you can see that has a sort of three dimensionality, just even as a flat image. Actually, it means that there is sort of parallax factor in all of the apps. So they're made in a sort of quasi 3D. So if you look at how he builds a 3D scene or how a 3D scene is then built, this is a speeded up version of Ed working on a piece of foliage, people. One piece of foliage, yes? All the pieces of foliage get this treatment. So he's now got a net over that piece of foliage, and he's now playing with it. You can see he's like pulling it out. Can you see pulling it mm -hmm. towards you? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. hmm. So that what I have now is a three-dimensional mm -hmm. piece of shrubbery. And similarly, I have a three-dimensional set of musical instruments, and indeed a three-dimensional kitchen. This is. Little Red Riding Hood's kitchen. So as you tilt the device, this is the perspective that you have on it. You can see it is almost like a kind of paper theatre. Oh, wow. How it's made. The characters having been made, having been drawn, are then broken. 
they're broken up into their constituent parts, and that looks pretty freaky uh, some of the time, and never more so than here, uh, where we have a dismembered little Red Riding Hood, um, and her <laughs> companion bee and a friendly owl, all with empty eyes. Um, and so then this dismembered version of the T form um, illustration can then be animated. And this is again just a little example of how Egg would do the animating. <laughs> I talked about the fact that Max was drawn all the time differently. Here, the expression has to come from things like the eyebrows. We only have one shot at her. It's through animation that we give her emotion, through animation that we give her character. As long as you're talking about animation, anima means soul. Yes, we've given her soul. We have given her soul. And a musical instrument and some multiple things to throw at the wolf. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, um, all of the characters make um, apparent movements with their mouth. Again, it felt when we started this, we knew it would be cheaper just to have them with smiling faces or lying faces. We don't. So every character has those one, two, three, four facial expressions. That is absolutely terrifyingly part of an ogre um, with his head and his socket size. But those are the four expressions that we then manipulate to create the sense that they are speaking. So if I do this, you can see that they look as if they're talking. We then go into an audio studio and we record voices. We use children. This was very important to me at the beginning. My children were relatively young when I started the business. And um, I, know, I had noticed for many years that while they ignored me completely, they, they listened to big children. And um, I thought there was a really interesting thing about using children's voices um, for adult and children's parts. Um, when we were telling these stories. We were not good at doing audio. I played this piece of audio before and, and it is an indicator of how pants we were. It's also important because it is an indication of going having to go back to the studio because something was not clear to a child when they got hold of the app. So this was a pick-up piece of audio. When I talk about non-linearity, this is a perfect example. We thought we'd written the script, we thought we'd recorded the script, but there was a point at which a child, children did not know what to do or how to interact with a particular scene. And so we went back, we wrote more text, and we came up with this. We weren't good at it, and it was under a lot of time pressure. There's another job! This is, is that the right intonation? This is another job. Um, I think, I think it is. Well. As you're well, let's just have an argument. It. So is it, a, is it a discovery? Ignore the child. Confirmation. In the, or in the audio brief. No, no. Is it, is it Ignore her. Dead? Should I do both versions? I mean, should I do Should I do both of them? I never yeah. think we should have an argument. That's not a job. Yes, yeah, I mean, being introduced to the it is sort of. Should I say it both ways? <laughs> There's another jar, and then um, there's another jar. So she knew she could stress it. I think the first one. Okay. Fine, we're done. I mean, actually, we could have cut to the chase and said, okay, give us two versions, and we wouldn't have had to have that ludicrous argument. <laughs> Normally, we are better than that, but that was um, not our finest hour. Um, and we still run up, but this is not an area of great expertise for us. And there were many people, there were three people in that studio, in theory, doing voice direction, which is never in itself obviously a good plan. Um, we had a, an, and we had an engineer, so there were four people and one child. It was a recipe for disaster. Um, but we were up against it, as I say. Um, we then had music, and I, I hope you got a bit of a sense of that. So people have themes, and the music will change. It's supposed to be slightly worrying. As opposed to in the house. Soon the basket was packed. Which is just a much lighter, more upbeat. Was ready 
piece of music. This piece of this music was written, and most of our music is written by people who write music for games. We discovered that one of the challenges was that if people wrote um, music for uh, for film, for example, on TV, they would write um, very narrative music, and you can't have narrative music in this because you you have to have just kind of mood music because you don't know how long a child's going to spend. You can't dictate, obviously, we don't want to dictate how long a child is going to spend in any given scene. So you have to have something that loops but does not loop in an obvious or irritating way. This is Robin Beanland who did the music for Little Red Riding Hood. It's brilliant. Um, we then uh, code the app. We then code the app, we're coding the app the whole time. Um, we are coding these apps in um, native C language. We are also now using Unity for some of the work that we do, but certainly initially there wasn't anything that enabled us to do things with the level of complexity that we wanted, the level of richness that we wanted, that was a kind of off the peg, pre-existing thing. So we now have a big box of top secret code that we own and can redeploy Clearly, once you've had somebody take something out of a basket once, you can use that same code to take something else out of something else, if you see what I mean. There, there are elements of the code that, that are a bit like um, Lego blocks that you can then use to build other things. Um, for anybody who thinks, I know that lots of people feel that the, the um, writing and the illustration are the really creative part of app, write, of app creation, um, I would say that the coding is hugely, hugely, hugely important and hugely creative. And though this doesn't really give you any indication of it properly, this is a visualization of the creation of code. Every dot here is an asset. It could be a, an image or a piece of animation or a piece of audio. Everything, that, every time it comes in, that's a new lot of stuff being added. Every time it lights up, something's being done to it. Every time a line is created, something, links are being made between those assets. And this is running along the 25th of January, 26th of January, 27th of January, 28th of January. You get big imports of something. For example, if you import audio, you might get another flurry of stuff coming in. Like that. Great on cue. Um, we made the app. We are now in the dreary, monotonous process of bug fixing. Um, and this uh, we do very technically. It's a fantastic technical tool we have here. Um, yeah, with a, with a, I like to see a dragon drawn on, you know, a monster uh, drawn by Ed. Um, so this is Ed's uh, logbook with, where he's seen things that are wrong and, has, and he's um, or missing and he's lopping them out. Um, so this is bug fixing. So far, well, we have probably shown it to children who are familiar with our work. We haven't shared this with children who do not know our apps. Because it's made of so many different constituent parts, inviting children to examine apps prior to them working is sort of an impossibility. It really is hard. And it's one of the things that make the iterative process very tricky, because you have to get quite a long way down the line before you have something that is robust enough for any, for any child, really, to use of, of the age group that we are hoping would use this. And those are really children from about four to eight. So, um, so far, no child has seen it. We fix the bugs, and then this is the point where we do the user testing. So this is the point at which, for example, we discover that we needed that extra piece of audio dialogue that we need to go into the studio to, um, to fix. And here's another interesting visual version of that. We, I'm a book publisher, really, and um, in books, our orientation is almost always left to right. We always expect the action will, if I'm coming into a book, that will come in this way. That's what I will do. I'm loving this. Just doesn't. If I'm a protagonist, that's my mode of direction. I'm moving through the narrative, turning that page. So my instinct, our instinct, was to put Jack on that side. It turns out, turned out that because we were hoping that we wanted children to solve the puzzle of how to release the dragon by pressing the bar, by pressing the stones, and he gives you cues. Um, the character gives you cues of what you might do. We discovered that children who are 90% right-handed were resting their hand here, and so they couldn't see the impact of what they were doing on the dragon's cage. And we realized that wasn't working. They couldn't see the effect of that action, and we did have to switch it. So that's actually how it ended up being. It's a tiny, tiny example, but a good example of picking up um, user experience and, and working out how that feeds through into, 
into what happens next. On a good day, the results of the activities that we have done, all that work, and it is the most extraordinary amount of work, it's kind of like nine months from start to finish to make an app like Little Red Riding Hood. Um, we get this fantastic, this fantastic expressions of parental trust. Ben Johncock is somebody who um, follows us on Twitter and who wrote this to us. Nosy Crow apps take storytelling to the next level. I know that I can download a Nosy Crow app and pass it to my daughter without even looking at it first. In the digital world, that is unparalleled. This is somebody who had experience of, had been following us all the way through our apps and was now at a point when he was willing to buy and give to his, I guess, kind of early school age child uh, apps. We also have got quite a lot of teacher trust now. Little Red Riding Hood by Nosy Crow is just what we expected it to be, it says teachers with apps. An, exa an exemplar educational book app in every possible way. They have thought of everything, pure perfection as always. That matters a lot to us. Um, and the results are also, I think, enormously importantly, empowered, engaged child readers who are having fun. This is um, one of my favorite photographs of a child interacting with one of our apps. This is Enos. And Inez is just turned, has just turned eight. She was seven when that picture was taken. I've never met Inez. I've never met Inez's mum. But Inez's mum follow, follows us on Twitter. Inez has Down syndrome, and um, she loves our apps. And her mother writes often about, will tweet often about the fact that Inez knows the dialogue from our apps absolutely completely. She was taking to a pantomime or a play version of Little Red Riding Hood, for example, and shouted out all of the nosy crow lines of dialogue before anyone could say anything. <laughs> um, and um, I just think it, there's such joy in that child's face, I think. It makes me feel everything is worthwhile or work. And when you're thinking about an empowered child, in that case, obviously a child with special needs, but this is a child who doesn't have special needs. It's an anonymous year two child, so this child would be six. Um, and it was quoted by an Australian teacher, Gabriella Shallot, who said, I like the app Jack and the Beanstalk because you can rule the app you way you, the way you want to. It doesn't rule it for you. That's such a fantastic thing for us to hear. Because we are balancing out how much freedom we give to the child and how much reading experience and narrative we're delivering to the child. But for that child, they felt that they had a lot of autonomy within that app. And that's exactly what we want. I thought I'd show you this. Um, in, I don't know what, sometimes I don't know what the language is for, for reading learning, certainly not in America, but in the UK we would have book, we would call, I mean, it's such an obvious thing to do, we'd call a book like this, which most kids in the UK would know, a known text. So these are books that children who've had them, a familiar text, so a book that a child has had again and again and again to the point that they can recite bits of it. This is Dylan with three little pigs. Hi, I'm a sweet little pig. We try and play for the little pig to leave their home and make them very well. <laughs> That's exactly the text. Be happy, but beware of the big bad wolf. It will be nice to have a little rest. <laughs> Shh, don't tell them I'm here. That's the don't wolf up here. Don't tell them I'm here. Don't tell them I'm here. He remembers what the wolf says. Mm -mm, mm -mm. He's singing. I just think that's very interesting. That's, a, that's demonstrating, I think, that uh, digital text can become a familiar text in just the same way that a picture book text can. That a child like Inez, a child like Dylan, neither of whom I've met, I hate to add, because as if they're my own, um, but uh, neither of whom we've met. These are things that were spontaneously sent by their, in by their parents. These are known texts, they're loved texts, they're helping them with the idea of story, they are potentially helping to scaffold their early understanding that text delivers meaning. Mm -hmm. I think this is interesting too, this is an American child who was prompted by the Three Little Pigs again to illustrate his own book. It's a, very, it's a home movie, it's a mess, but I just think from a visual perspective, but I think it's really interesting, he's six. Well, this is my book, The Three Little Pigs. I will read it to you in a second, but just so you know, 
this little pig doesn't know that the big bad wolf is hiding right behind. <laughs> Okay, now we can start the book. <laughs> the Three Little Pigs. The Three Little Pigs. See, imagine writing here. Happily just in their home until a big bad wolf arrived in the neighbor's house. Houses. He flew down the house, but first of all, he huffed. And he puffed and he blew the house down. And here's the pictures. And I have one more thing to show you on the back. I copied the big bad wolf's truck. <laughs> Where did you see this truck? In the Three Little Pigs book on my iPad. What did you think of the story that you played with on the iPad? I thought it was cool because you can could make him go. And the house would shake. <laughs> and and you could make everything stay up in the air for a while. So I think that's really in interesting to see that. Looking for digital marketing assistance. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's our man. He's our man. But I think there's something fascinating about just the fact that he was prompted to write. He was prompted to write. He was prompted to do his own writing. He was prompted to do his own creation as a result of an app that he'd seen in just the same way that a child might be inspired by a print book. Um, this is this is India, who's just hilarious and who I absolutely adore. This is India playing with Cinderella. Her mum sent this in. Hello, I'm Cinderella. This is I am India. This is a game called Cinderella. It's made by Nogi Crow. Can you hold it so we can see it? I love this. She oh, tries to show it, but she can't. She wants to bring it back to her. Can you tell us what you're doing, sweetheart? Lovely girl called Cinderella. No, she can't tell you what she's doing. She has step after two So, India, what kind of app is this? It's a naughty cross. I know, but what is it? Is it a game or? It's a daughter's beautiful. It's a book called Cinderella. It's, a, it's an interactive book. It's she had no nice clothes and was covered in dust and dirt from walking in the So city. what are you doing right now? I'm helping her with her to pretty color. I'm helping her with the kitchen. She's so engrossed, she stops. Oh, so you kitchen. get to play with the book while you're reading it? Yes. It's looking tidier and you already. Now, did you choose to have it read to you or can you do it other ways? Can you like tap on words and have them Yes, say? you may do that. Like, I really like it to be to me. And why is that? Because I don't like doing things by myself. Well, I kind of like to use it. Where's the rest? You got filthy in here. I kind of like to and not at the same time. <laughs> I see. So where are we going now? We're going to find another plate. So did you know the story already? No. You did not know the story of Cinderella? Can you help me stop? Yes, yes I did. Is there anything else you'd like to say about this? Yes. It's a different Is it super fun? Yes. Don't Could you look at the camera first? I can't no. And y'all? Yeah. Is it super fun? Yes. Look at me, honey bun. Yes, it is very fun. <laughs> <laughs> He's just wonderful. You should sell plush too. <laughs> I, know, I love this. It's That's the, right. The armpit toy. I mean, you know, it's so marvelous. <laughs> India with her armpit toy. She's just so great. Anyway, um, we talked a lot about digital and, and about making the apps. I pre publish print books and I brought an indecent number of books that I um, publish and a lot that other people publish that I love um, that I've just put out there. They're all for preschool for preschoolers to sort of six seven year olds um i think that what remains the same regardless of the medium is our activistic need for story and if i were to ask any of you what was happening in that picture you would all tell me something slightly different 
because you are all storytellers. We are all made to be storytellers. You would construct a story out of that if I pushed you to do so. I will not, for there is a camera running. Um, but you would talk to me about, you could tell me whether you, what you thought she felt about him, about them, what they felt about him, what he was talking about. You would have an idea. And I do think that because we are the people who are descended from people who were knowing about the saber-toothed tigers, because we could actually make sense of the world by telling stories, by understanding stories. So our atavistic need for story is a very, very deep-rooted, fundamental thing. And regardless of the medium, that remains. If you doubt that for a second, I think this is very interesting. This is Amber, who's from South Africa. Her mother sent this in. She is somebody who's had read to her um, some books I haven't bought. They're a series called Pick and Posy. They're very simple books in which a, a, which a rabbit character and a mouse character go through um, emotional trauma. We, we describe them as when bad things happen to good toddlers. And um, they're about bad things. And children find them absolutely fascinating in a kind of schadenfreude, sort of walking two moons in someone else's moccasins sort of way. They find them really interesting. This child has a kind of catechism of that story. She is 20 months old. Listen to this. What happened to Posy? The other stupid. What did she hurt? I had a knee. And who helped her? And what did he put on her knee? Yeah, and now she's all better. The mother said that child told that story to anyone who would listen right, in that kind of formalized catechism form. She's a storyteller. She's 20 months old. Children, of course, of all of us, need story, need story to make sense of their worlds. And I think what doesn't change also is that despite the fantastic rise of this, we are not looking at an either-or situation. Reports of the death of print, <coughs> as Mark Twain said of himself, have been greatly exaggerated. The paper books keep going. Mm -hmm. And what I think I would say is that being a digital publisher, making digital things, has made me a better print publisher. It's made me think about what digital does brilliantly interactivity, multimedia, responsiveness, the opportunity for personalization, the opportunity for the experience not to be the same each time. It has also made me think of all the things that print does brilliantly. And here are just a few of them. This is a prayer book, which I think is in format terms rather exciting actually. I think we might see if we could make one like that. Um, there's a prayer book that I guess is sort of 14th, 15th century. A really key thing is that paper books keep going because they are very robust. And that makes them, of course, very suitable for little children. Biting an iPad is not um, to be recommended. Teething on an iPad is not to be recommended. Mm -hmm. That's a Sandra Boynton. I saw somebody had brought a Sandra Boynton. Um, I think another really interesting thing is that we get to decide the size of books. Apple gets to decide the size of an iPad screen. Mm -hmm. And this book, Weasels, is a book that is 12 inches by 12 inches and has very rich illustrations. I didn't bring it because it didn't actually fit in the case. But you can see that's an open spread of the book and that is what that spread would have to look like mm -hmm. on an iPad. It's a really different thing. I point out that the size of an iPad screen is roughly the same size as the page of a board book. Not spread of a board book, a page of a board book. Obviously the pro is bigger, but roughly the same size as a page of a board book. Imagine having to recount a story, this story, many of these stories, on a space that's that small. It means that there are particular exigencies associated with that size of space. Um, you got me to ask, to comment again, Jane, on the, on the question of the size, how much text you can put on the screen. And I think the size of the screen is one of the things that determines that. But they are big. Books can be big. And that means that they can accommodate bigger lumps of text. I cannot imagine putting that amount of text, that's two stanzas of a four-line verse, it's a, a narrative verse, a, a, verse, a story told in, in rhyme. Um, I can't imagine putting that much text on the screen. And I'm pretty sure most children would find that a massive turn-off. <laughs> they 
many different shapes. We can do square ones. We can do upright quarter ones. We can do landscape ones. Um, these all happen to be nose crow books, but I showed you the circular one right at the beginning that was the, the 15th century prayer book. We can play around in the shape of books extraordinarily. And indeed, their edges are not, um, are not the thing that, that finally determines them. So, for example, I can start off with a book that's that size, and because I can, I can make it a book that's that size. Mm -hmm. I can change the size of the book. I can change the size of the book every time. For example, I've got some busy bear books, and I can have characters that pop out of the side of a book. Now, the iPad does many wonderful things, but being able to break the frame that we've been given is not one of them. <laughs> so I talked about different shapes. Texture. We underestimate texture at our apparel. We were talking about Highlights magazine and the fact that um, it's printed, one of the distinctive things about it is that it's printed on, um, on uncoated stock. Do people know what uncoated stock is? Uncoated stock is, feels like, feels like this book. Coated stock feels like this book, which is the book of Little Red Dragon. And can you see it from here? This is, this is um, coated, but with spot UV. So in this case, we've made the water feel, be shiny and slick inside the book. So it has texture. So if I just pass those around, that's the thing we can do. And indeed, we can take that even further with a book like, a forthcoming book, like Where's Mr. Lion, which combines card and cloth. It's for a very little child, but that's got felt. So coated, uncoated, coated, coated with um, what you need and felt coming around. You can cut holes in them. As you'll see from that, open very carefully, which I'll just kick back for a nanosecond here. Open very carefully, unlike an iPad, um, has holes <laughs> in various, at various points in the story. This is about a crocodile who's trapped in a book and who works out how to get out of it by eating his way out. And I have yet to see a child who does not instantly do that. And that's what a child does. <laughs> so that's the crocodile disappearing through the back of the book. Books can have flaps, um, and this is an example of a can you say it too? So a very early reader, I would say, I mean, a book that you'd read, share with a child who's kind of on the cusp of language. So I think I would expect this to be read to a child between kind of maybe nine months and eighteen months. Um, we see a flap. Who is that in the barn? Can we guess? <gasps> Well, when we lift the flap, we will see that it's Happy Pig, oink, oink, and the child's invited to make that noise. And actually, because we can, in that final one, we have the flap, the secondary flap, with and her cheeky piglets, oink, oink, oink. Um, so that's a good example of flaps. But the truth is that pages are flaps, people, pages are flaps. Um, and in fact, the book I was talking about is a really perfect example of that, so what you'll all be really familiar with. But the way that it says here, that very night in Max's room, a forest grew and grew. That is a flap. We have revealed something completely different. And that experience, that tactile experience of moving that on is different, I think, from moving on an arrow. And I think that there's some very, very clever apps that are continuous scrollings, but they have lost something fundamental about the opportunity for change that is represented by a new scene, by a new page. <coughs> the Gruffalo is a good example, again. So in the Gruffalo, who knows the story of the Gruffalo? Gruffalo tells, uh, the mouse tells the story of a mythical creature called the Gruffalo and says, silly old snake, doesn't he know, silly old fox, doesn't he know there's no such thing as a Gruffalo? Goes on to the next animal, the silly old Owl, doesn't he know there's no such thing as a gruffalo? He meets his name. Silly old snake, doesn't he know there's no such thing as a gruffalo? Oh! And that's a page turn. Mm -hmm. That's like a flap. That's a flap like we're mm -hmm. The other fundamental truth is that in the end, some people are better at story making 
than others. Some of us were the guy in the cave, some of us the guy in the cave who's holding the sticks apart and telling the story of the mammoth that got away. Some of us are the people who are simply listening. I speak as one of the ones who's most of the time simply listening. So, here are some people who are good at story. Who's that? Correct. And this? And this? It obviously is really important if you're going to make this if, to be an old white bloke with a beard. I'm just... <laughs> um, Gary Paulson, um, really there, uh, confirming that. You've got to have the beard. You, well, you can actually manage to do it without a beard if you are rolled up. Thank you very much. You can manage to do it without a beard, but you have to be old and white and male, all the same. Um, but until we have people like. JK. And he's got a beard. <laughs> Jerry Pinkney. Jerry Pinkney. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Margaret Wise Brand. Walter oh. D. Wise. Wow. And finally, a bit of a rogue one here, one for another famous woman. Um, Suzanne Collins, Hunger Games. So I was going for something that was a little bit broader in terms of age groups. Some people are better at story than others. These are all good examples, familiar to American ideas, um, that of people who are great at story. And for the rest of us, finding them <laughs> and making the good stuff requires hard work, skill, experience, discrimination, and passion. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? I did it to time. You sure did. Does anyone have any questions? I have a quick question. So, in looking at the books, I'm curious how you mentioned that change it, it's changed the way you made books, making apps. Do you have some examples you can share? I think it just makes me think about yeah. format much more. It makes me think about paper stock much more. It makes me think about distribution of text. It makes me think about page time. I always thought about those things, but I think it makes me think with much more intensity about that, about the potential of print. That's something I'm looking at all the time. And a good example would be, I mean, for one interesting thing about apps is that they are they're not length limited. I don't know how many scenes there are in Red Riding Hood. I know Ed, Will, and AJ would absolutely know how many scenes there were in Little Red Riding Hood. I can't now recall exactly how many. I know that I'm dealing with, in a picture book, for example, I'm either dealing with 12 spreads, if it's an including ends book, end papers book, anyone who wants to know about the technicalities of this can see me afterwards, or I'm dealing with 14 and a half spreads. 14 spreads on a final page. Um, that's including title page and so on. So sometimes I found that the exigencies of money would suggest that you would go for the 12 spread book. You would always do books that were inclusive of ends. I found that doing the apps, um, which A, put all other expenditure into a shocking perspective, um, and B, make you think about how books work. Often I've pushed things from 12 spreads to 14 and a half, just in order to take advantage, for example, of that page time. Because I felt there wasn't actually enough space for the story. Apps make you quite generous with space for the story. And I found that sometimes I've had to expand the book at more cost to us as a publisher in order to accommodate the story differently. So those are examples of having done that. Yes. Do you dub uh, British English into American English? We don't for the... Um, we don't for the apps. Um, uh, we, we thought about it, but a lot of the comments that we got back were, they're quite premium apps. We're selling these at $4.99 most of the time. We got a lot of comments back that said that they were, that they really liked the English voices. They really mm -hmm. liked British voices. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the things that gave us control over Mm. over the recording sessions, which as you can see, we deployed so well. Um, but it gave, us, it gave us a kind of management around casting, and I mean, just in terms of cost, to have that level of management without kind of completely outsourcing Americanization would be very tricky. You can toggle between English um, spelling and American spelling, so favorite and color, words like that, um, are different. Um, and if, you're, if we ever use, we wouldn't, but if we use a word like pavement or nappy, we would switch that to cyborg and diaper, so we'd have two versions. 
we have the same child saying it. Um, where we've done, we did, I didn't bring any, but we have done some nursery rhymes and we sold those with a QR code in the front cover. It's another good example of how being a, being a publisher of digital has made me think differently. But we have a QR code in the front cover of all of our paperback, which is a bigger market paperback in the UK than it is in the US. Um, and if you scan that, you get an audio version of the book. And we found that um, the American market wanted those fairy tales to be done in American accents, as we've done them in American accents. Interestingly, though, by extension, we have now done a Colombian accented Spanish version, which we made in Caracas, um, of Cinderella and the Three Big Pigs, which is about to come out, and a Chinese version, a Mandarin Chinese version, which we've recorded in Shanghai. Um, so we've done those two. That's proven to us how hot, the length of time that's taken and the effort of that and our inability to quality control that has been really, really challenging for us. We could talk afterwards, I could give you some very professional people. They were, it, they were fine, it was just that we were dealing, you know, then we were all dealing with, not in the case of Spanish, which we actually, enough of us could manage for it not to be an issue, but certainly in the case of Mandarin, we were dealing with issues around proofreading, issues around <laughs> matching audio with text, I mean it was tough, obviously. Even American people, we can understand most of the time. So, um, <laughs> so that wouldn't have been a real objection. It's a cost thing, really. Kate, can I add, can I ask so the teachers here? Is that a big deal? Do you have any comments about the uh, British narration? Just with my own personal children, I think it is it higher interest. Um, higher interest if it's if we, with the British accent um, to a point where. I, daughter when she was younger and would hear or see or something that had a British accent and I said, you know, she's using a British accent. And I've heard some students and stories from teachers saying the same thing where, you know, this person all of a sudden is speaking in a British accent. I think it's just a high interest in difference novel. I, I was recanting the fact that my children would play, would reenact Disney films. We had, they didn't know, didn't understand for a long time that there was just this like endless stream of stuff that could come out of television. We managed that, but they had DVDs, <laughs> the olden days, or even videos. Um, and we, so they used, their exposure to American media was very limited to Disney, and they loved, 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 loved Disney princess stuff. And they would play, they would reenact Disney princess games, and they would use American accents to indicate that they were now in the game. And then stage directions were given in British English. And then you moved back, and then you were Cinderella or Snow White or whoever you were being, and you put an American accent to be the princess. From a, all Americans had, all princesses have American accents. But from a curriculum point of view, is that a deal breaker? Would no. you eliminate that from your curriculum if it has? No, 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 if it was a phonics app, yes. Yes. But see, that's yeah. but this isn't. This we is a story app. Don't set out to assume anything about American pedagogy. We don't assume to know anything about phonics. We are, this is about reading for pleasure, it's about story for pleasure, it's about interacting with narratives for pleasure. Have any of the teachers here ever used a Nosy Crow app in your classroom? I, I have, way back when. I just can't believe how good they were right out of the door. They were just so fabulous. Are there any features that you would like that aren't there that would make it more classroom usable? I, I, have, I don't have a classroom, but my question for you that sort of leads into that, there's been research, and maybe Lisa and Lisa will come back to me with actual quoting on this, but I believe there's research that's talked about how when there are interruptions that are like games in the story that interrupt the flow of the narrative, that the comprehension of the actual storyline really decreases. And so, I mean, like, have you done any testing about whether the kids actually understand the story? And have you considered doing, like, for a classroom setting, kind of like a straight through version that we doesn't? We do have a straight through version. So okay. you kind of read to me, okay. and that delivers it to you. So there's a, there's a version that, that takes, up, takes out the interactivity. We try to break the narrative. This comes back to the point of how much text you have on each lump. We are trying to deliver the narrative in very manageable lumps. We do not enable interactivity until you have had that lump of narrative. So you get those two lines, maximum three lines of text, before you can do anything. And thereafter, we're trying really, thank you, we're trying really hard to make sure that the games, the activities, are genuinely associated with the story. 
And so there are things that we we eliminated from early apps. You could, in the three of the pigs, spin the characters if you yeah. chose to. Mm -hmm. And we found that kids were just doing that all the time. Mm -hmm. So we actually took it away from them. <laughs> um, because it didn't feel to me as if that was doing the thing that we say we're doing, which is about delivering a reading experience and an enhanced and um, interactive and multimedia game experience, but we are at uh, the reading experience, but we're not making a game when we're making those apps. We make other apps which are games. Um, so I think that we have tried to think very hard about, for example, if you remember India, using the Cinderella, um, it's, uh, using the Cinderella piece. Cinderella repeatedly says, oh, thank you very much for helping me. There's so much to do in this kitchen. You know, can you help me sort the place? Can you help me do? So the prompts are associated with her as a, to, 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 for the child to engage with the idea of her as a drudge. Right. You know, quite good fun things to do, but they are, you, know, you get the sense of her, you know, her endless tasks. So you're trying to make sure that the games have real meaning. Jack and the Beanstalk is a really interesting example for us because it's the most gamified version of mm -hmm. a book that we did. And in Jack and the Beanstalk, we, um, we enabled you to win or lose. So there are various, uh, I said that in Little Red Riding Hood, Little Red Riding Hood always defeats the wolf. The grandmother always comes out of the, out of the wardrobe, the closet, and um, they always sit down and have the food that was in her, that she packed in her basket to begin with. So there's always a kind of happy ending how she defeats the wolf that is different in, in the world. In the case of Jack and the Beanstalk, if you did not accomplish Jack's tasks in each of the rooms that he went into, you would chase down the, you woke the giant and the giant chased you down the beanstalk. And you might end up with, you know, nothing. Or you might end up with the golden coins, or you might end up with the golden coins and the goose, or you might end up with the heart and the goose and the golden coins. And each of those endings was different depending on how well you had gained. And that just meant that we kept the text in those contexts of encouraging that child to engage with the activity to an absolute minimum. It was down to like a line. There's a lot of lines, right. there's a lot of scenes, it's still a very rich reading experience, but it's broken up into very, very distinctive bits. It's another reason to do this, obviously, with fairy tales, because actually a lot of the children have residual understanding of fairy tales. A lot of the time this is deepening an understanding of the fairy tale. It's a fairy tale with a twist. Um, mm. And I think that that's another really legitimate thing to do. There are so many marvellous, marvellous, marvellous examples of people who've taken fairy tales and done much less um, true to the original narrative things with them that continue to enhance children's reading. But I think the scaff often for children I don't think any, I don't think any of the, I don't think any of the stories would be incomprehensible, but often they are underpinned by a prior knowledge of that narrative. A question here. Well, actually, a comment. So I was writing some nice touches. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I think the thing, a couple of things that make what you do different, and in my opinion, much better, is that all of the <laughs> taking yeah, my notes um, is that the action not only is related to the story it's sometimes imperative to the story and if you're not a great reader or your language isn't strong all those bits and pieces help add to the your understanding of the story as opposed to take you out of the story you know so when cinderella's being a drudge and you, you get this real sense because you got to put all the plates away that you you understand even if you don't understand all the words what that's about so it's a great opportunity as a teacher or a parent to have that conversation with a child who doesn't necessarily have the words to go with it because they've done the action. The other thing is the thing that you do really well is put the user in control of a very well-designed controlled world. It's not like they can do anything, but they still always come away feeling like they have control. And control is such a motivator. So that, that bravo. comment from the child, the Australian child, I think, um, is a really good indicator of that. We, yeah. we are always worried that we are imposing too much kind of good for you stuff. Um, you know, we're not in a chocolate covered broccoli sort of world here, but we're sometimes concerned that we are enforcing too much um, reading experience on children who may not want that. But that is the route we've chosen, and that is what we consider to be important and really fundamental to our, to the principles of what we, do, what we do when we're making this kind of app, when we're making this kind of story app. And a lot of the time, there are options, opportunities to add 
games and little twizzly bits, bells and whistles, to endless numbers of things, and we don't do it. I mean, and, and this is a really interesting issue in relation to authors and illustrators, because we have authors and illustrators coming to us all the time saying, we've got this fantastic idea for now. They say, oh, really? And they say, yes, and it's set in my time. And when, when you touch the stars, they twinkle. <laughs> if I, honestly, if I had $20 for every time somebody said, if you touch stars, they twinkle, I would be significantly richer and upgrading on my way back. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but I don't get twenty dollars for every time somebody says that. It just it happens a lot that people assume that because you can do it, you should do it, okay. and we don't take that view at all. And there's lots of straight narrative scenes. If you're deliberate, this scene is a good example where we've broken that up from this from from the next scene, which is the scene in which oh sorry the previous scene, the scene in which she packs the she packs the basket in this scene. So you've got one bit of text. I can't do anything. But now I can. And it went ding, and now I can. And now I can. Let's fill up this basket If I try and put something that's not edible in, I think we should leave that here. I can do it. That. And she does want jello. Grandma likes jello. And that's an example we do have a jello version actually. Let's fill up this basket with lovely things with grandma. So you're being encouraged to do those things, and that's away from this. Because this is really important. The basket was packed, and little red riding hood was ready to go on. Nothing to do here, be careful people. In the forest and beware of the big bad wolf. Nothing to do here, because I want to make sure that somebody's noticed that. But the big bad wolf is the threat here. So you don't get to do anything here. You left that, that very, very spare. It's just against a blank wall so that you're not encouraging the child to think that they can interact. Thanks for the wonderful talk.